Hi everybody. Uh, I'm Hossein Jashtsas and I'm a postdoc at Vanderbilt uh, with Gregor Neuert and uh, I'm excited to present to you my research on mathematical models of cell signaling in temporal environments. And first of all, that I would like to also thank the organizers for this opportunity. And so, so before that, uh, this is an outline of my talk to orient uh, everyone. I will go through a brief background, then I will share with you single cell experiments that we have done on measuring signaling responses and in the next section, I will talk about our mathematical modeling framework and a slide on the future direction. So, so cells in the physiological environments experience different stimuli types, such as nutrients, such as signals from other cells or environmental stresses. So the, uh, these, these stimuli changes over time and space and the cells in order to adapt to such changes undergo a variety of functions such as their shape could change, their growth division could change or a change in their gene expression pattern. So to uh, perform these functions, cells uh, uh, implement this signal transduction networks where proteins regulate each other to enable the cells to give a response, but the dynamics of the signaling proteins, such as the phosphorylation over time or the nuclear localization over time is important in determining cellular fate decision. For example, for P53, which is a DNA damage sensor, it's shown that it is pulsatile activity versus it is sustained activity over time could result in different phenotypes and these dynamics, it's shown that for P53, for example, pulsatile activity is due to this negative feedback from MDM2 at the downstream of P53 activity and uh, blocking this negative feedback using the rocks could transition these pulses to sustain response. So I'm interested to understand in this project, uh, uh, how, how does the different signaling proteins uh, uh, interact with each other, how those give rise to different cellular response dynamics over time, and how the two uh, impact uh, cellular response and phenotype. So compared to this standard paradigm in cell biology, where cells are exposed to uh, uh, different stimuli or drug concentration instantaneously, uh, from a constant level to, diff to another constant level. In this project, we consider temporal cell stimulation. So uh, we, we apply this, this uh, concentrations uh, over time and at different time scales. So during this talk, I will briefly go through how do we in implement these in experiments and in modeling. And the result is that uh, this type of cell stimulations result in distinct cellular responses. And I will discuss how these type of data sets are really helpful in parameterizing and building predictive signaling models. So in the experiments, I should also first point out this framework in both experiment and the modeling is general and could be applied to different cell types. But here in this part, I will uh, share with you our results on using yeast cells. So, so the system I'm using, the model system I'm using is uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. And uh, when, when, this, when this yeast cells, uh, the, uh, the osmolarity changes in their environment, such as an increase in the concentration of salt or sugar, the cell volume shrinks down and the water leaves the cell and that's stressful for the cell, and this cells implement this uh, HOG1 pathway, which stands for high osmolarity glycerol to, uh, to uh, uh, adapt to this environment. So when the osmolarity changes in the environment of the cell, there are different proteins in this pathway that go through phosphorylation, and at the end, HOG1 
gets phosphorylated and the cells, the cells in asthma adaptation. So there are few processes here involved. HAG1 often phosphorylation through different branches, SLM1 and SHO1 branch, uh, gets unphosphorylated by phosphatases. But HAG1's phosphorylation helps the glycerol to uh, helps the cells to shut down this glycerol efflux channels, and that's how the cells maintain internal glycerol. And HAG1 translocates to nucleus and upregulates uh, essentially the, the genes that are important in this glycerol production and maintenance. And some of them are GPT1, 2, or GPP1 and 2. So this HAG1's nuclear localization Allow, allows us to tag this with fluorophore and use, use uh, fluorescence microscopy and use this as a readout for pathway activation. So in the experiment, we are interested in basically increasing the concentration of salt as a change in osmolarity and quantify this HAG1 nuclear localization. So in this slide, I will show how do we achieve this temporal uh, stimuli. So we use a pump that gradually pumps in a concentrated uh, stimulus to this um, uh, to this flask where there is a mixer and that mixes this and we program this pump such that we are able to achieve any concentration over time uh, uh, in, in this flask, which we are delivering that using these tubes to the cells that are sitting in this flow chamber using another pump too that's functioning in a small rate. And, and the, the cells are, uh, the HAG1 kinase is tagged with fluorophore and localizes the nucleus when osmolarity increases. And we, uh, we register these images. So here in this movie, each ring shows one of the yeast cells and the color red shows this, uh, this HAG1 localized to nucleus and this is playing in a fast mode and in a loop. So we register these images at, at, different, at different time points and we do image segmentation, single cell analysis and correction for photo bleaching over time. And we end up with this trajectories for single cells over time. Then we get the means of hundreds of such single cells as a HAG1 nuclear localization for the measure of pathway activation. So using this, now we are able to quantify these signaling responses under different stimuli uh, conditions. In the left, I'm showing different profiles of salt increases, 2.6 molar within 25 minutes. And compared to a, a sudden step, like we use this nonlinear polynomial inputs that they go out with a delay and they start with a, small, a slow rate, then the rate also is increasing over time. So in this panel, C, I'm showing the quantified uh, uh, volume change of the single cells from a uh, few biological replicates. We see that in the no salt condition cells, is, uh, cells normally expand their volume uh, a step results in a dramatic volume change, then it adapts back, and the temporal inputs results in a slow, a slower and more gradual shrink in the cell volume. And at the signaling level, we see that the sudden step results in a most strong signaling activation going from a step to the, poly, to the uh, last polynomial. We see there is a lag that, uh, in the signaling activation, and that comes from the fact that the rates are here slow. Then the peak response shifts to the right, doesn't go as high as a step. All of them follows uh, adaptation to pre-stimular level when we are uh, fixing this at this final concentration. So these are the type of data we are able to measure and quantify. And this is one final concentration I'm showing, but I have done these experiments at multiple final concentrations. Now we are interested to use this kind of rich data sets to, uh, uh, to parameterize models and try to make predictions from those models for signaling activation. So in the modeling part that I have worked, collaborated with Brian Mansky and Zach Fox, uh, 
So we, uh, we implement uh, ordinary differential or ODE models where the proteins or the signaling pathways are regulating each other. And at the end, it is activating this HOG1. And we are considering, and there are different uh, feedbacks to the upstream from HOG1 in this pathway. And we are considering different models with different complexities here and trying to fit these models to some data and making predictions. So to just go through in these two slides, how do we do this? So this is, let's say, our measurements under some stimulation, uh, stimulation conditions, we have the signaling response measurements. So, so we take these models, the last note here, such as in this one, X5 represents HUG1 activity, and we fit this model and constrain its parameters such that the model fits our measurements. Then using this constraint, parameters, we are interested to basically make prediction for the HOG1 activity or for this x activity under different conditions. And those are such, such as a different stimulation conditions that's different than what we use to train the model or a mutation condition. Let's say in the model, we express this protein at different level and we do the same for the cells in experiments, then to compare basically what model predicts for those new testing conditions. And these are some of the results in this slide. So here in this four node model, HAG1 gets phosphorylated by PBS2 through two uh, different brands, so SLM1 and SHO1, then the osmolarity change in environment. So the model fit is shown in red colors here to the data that has been measured under step 0.4 molar. And we see that model reproducibly fits this data. Then we are interested to take this param uh, parameters that we estimate by this training and make predictions using this for a new experimental condition, which is a linear increase to 0.4 molar. I believe this is in 15 minutes compared to a step that goes instantaneously. So we see that predictions from these parameter sets doesn't match the data. So we consider different models. I'll go through some of these here. This is the first one, a negative feedback loop. Each of these models are uh, directly implemented from this paper here that we see each of these fits this, uh, this data. It is a perfectly ad uh, uh, adapting data set. And uh, from these models, the first model is a capable of adaptation, even the other models that are not capable of adaptation because they don't have negative feedback or they are not incoherent fit forward, even though some of them are uh, fit forward. So they all fit this data that's adaptive. But similar to previous slide, they are not able to make predictions for new conditions. Okay, so moving forward here, we're considering uh, uh, to uh, what we did, we simulated signaling activation data under temporal stimuli conditions that's similar to what we implemented in experiment. And we, we used a model, we trained this such that it simulates, it generates signaling activation that represent what we have measured in our experiment in a sense that a step results in a strongest response. We see this lag in higher polynomials, response are shifting to right and we see the adaptation. I should also mention this model also uh, represents the hog pathway in a way that it's a branch pathway. It has been uh, the feedbacks and X4 would represent hog one activity. And, and activation here is the X4 activity. And so we, we generated data under different final concentration of these profiles. Then we asked this following question, which and what set of this data we should, to, we should use to train this model such that we can predict the remaining our conditions. So here is some of the results. So when we train that model with a set of step inputs data sets, uh, I'm showing here the fits in red compared to training data, they, they fit really great, they match the data. Then from these, we make prediction for a new test condition for a linear, or nonlinear condition, we see that in both cases, predictions don't match test data. On the other hand, 
when we use the same amount of data, now this time one from each of temporal inputs, we see that the fits are similar to step conditions, but now it is uh, predicting the new test conditions uh, 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 greatly. So in, in both conditions, the test data is not included in train data. So, uh, so this, uh, this shows uh, how well we are able to, if we train the model using temporal inputs, predict for new uh, cell stimulation conditions. And we were interested to look at few mutant conditions. Here we uh, eliminate this feedback from this model as expected from literature compared to wild type, the model without the feedback results in a stronger uh, HOG1 activity in purple. Now we were interested to use the model that we trained, the wild type model that we, we trained uh, using it is wild type data, using this black data, uh, but under a temporal, uh, 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 a diverse temporal conditions to see if we can predict this mutant responses, the purple responses. And here I will show how does the model perform. So predictions would be from the model that we trained using the six data set. And the, the, uh, the test data sets are for these conditions when, the, when this feedback has been removed, when this, this feedback has been removed. So another mutant condition we consider is the case that we have identified in our lab. So we have shown that when the rate of uh, stimuli is smaller, is slow, there are no HAG1 activity. In order to have HAG1 nuclear localization, the rate at which the stimuli is increasing should be higher than a threshold. We have also shown that among all these proteins, PTP2, a phosphatate that unphosphorylate HAG1, is very important in setting this rate threshold. And this is results from the work of previous postdoc in our lab that we express this uh, phosphatase at different levels, going from this red to the black, the level of PTP2 increases, and HOG1, uh, uh, there are less, uh, less HOG1 activity when there are higher PTP2 uh, expression levels. So we produce similar data using this model, so for uh, compared to a wild type that is at one for the concentration of this node that deactivates HOG1, we express that at a half or we overexpress twofold. And we see for the higher phosphatases, we uh, uh, pass rate uh, results in uh, uh, less HOG1 activity. And similar to previous case, if we use this model that's trained with with uh, temporal uh, stimulation data when the wild type was set to one, then we mutate in a, in a same way the, the parameters that we inferred and the model prediction matches the test data for this two underexpressed or overexpressed condition. So this example shows that the, the use uh, training these models with dynamically rich data sets that we measure under uh, cell stimulation that we change them gradually over time uh, is, is quite helpful. And now we are considering in, uh, integrating this, this type of ODE models with the measurements that we have. So in this slide, uh, the, the black lines or gray scales are our measurements for HAG1 nuclear localization over time. This, this panel is a step change data. So what we do here, we fit this model for this data, for five, we use five first step conditions plus this control that the, it is in the media. And we make the, the reds are fit and we make predictions for new conditions. Those are uh, two higher final concentration of the step shown with the green. Predictions are green, reds are fit. And so when we, uh, when we uh, predict, uh, temporal input conditions. This is a, a root input or a linear input. We see that as we go away from this training condition, the predictions doesn't match the data. They are so uncertain and unaccurate. 
But on the other hand, similar to the simulations, when now we use one of each of these temporal inputs, we see that while we haven't been able to yet train this model, fit them as perfect as the step condition, but the predictions has improved quite uh, substantially. And if I show the quantification of this result, the errors between model fit or uh, predictions from its corresponding train or test data. These are the quantifications. When we use temporal training inputs, we see that the prediction or the uh, predictions are improved and the errors are smaller. So similar to these conditions, now we are integrating more detailed model of Hagwan. So, uh, and this is ongoing work. So this is the model now uh, we, uh, we are uh, integrating with those measurements. And I will go through a few of, the, few of these questions that, that we are interested to investigate. One is being able to uh, build, uh, build predictive signaling models that can capture the signatures of signaling in temporally changing environments. So I will go through these four regimes that are important. One is the slow rate input stimuli that we have in our lab identified that if the rate is slow, there are no HAG1 activity, and this model captures this. Another is the result of this, the implication of this is if the environment changes non-linearly, in the beginning when the rate is slow, there is no HAG1 activation, and the data and model captures this lag in the signaling activation before the rate starts to uh, hit that, uh, that threshold. Another regime is this pulsatile inputs that there's a stimulation, then removing it and repeating that. And the, the model and experiments predicts that the responses are repetitive, the same. But in the case of a state case with the same step size as pulse that we don't remove the stimuli and keep uh, applying another change, we see that the model predicts that the, the next responses are different from the first one. It's either because it's not able to which uh, perfect adaptation or any other reason that we are now studying all these. So another question we are interested to using these approaches to study is that what protein and what protein interactions gives rise to each of these kind of sign signaling features and uh, working to implement this in MAPK signaling in human cells. So to, uh, to summarize, uh, so we implemented this temporal cell stimulation paradigm that allows us to compare to a sudden step-like change of stimuli or drug to apply more realistic uh, uh, stimulation to the cells that cells could experience this in physiology uh, uh, that resulted in uh, differential signaling activation and also uh, cell growth phenotype that I didn't go through because of the time during this talk. And the, uh, using, uh, using modeling approach, we showed that when we use temporal cell stimulation, that type of data sets better train signaling models. And that allowed us, this approach allowed us to predict uh, cellular response under new stimuli and genetic perturbation conditions. So with that, uh, I would like to make my acknowledgments. Everybody in the Neuer lab, my collaborators, my postdoctoral committee here at Vanderbilt, the resources, funding, and thank you for your attention. I will take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that great talk. We can do our Zoom applause. Um, there is a uh, question in the chat which is, do I understand correctly that the test data is from the same stimulus response as the training data, but just different data points? Yeah, so, so the, no, the, the, the training, so we generated, let's say, um, uh, 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 eight by six um, uh, data sets, and we, those data sets, each of these data sets is one stimulation condition, 
and we use some of those uh, simulation conditions for training and another set for the for the testing so to answer that question the test conditions are entirely different profile that either goes up in a different shape or it goes to a, to a different final concentration that was the case in both simulation and experiments great thank you other other questions feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question live Okay, then I will do that. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I was wondering if it's also possible to maybe play by by mutations. I'm I'm not enough into this field, so this might be stupid, but play with like reaction rates because the time scales involved, especially in this going up and down, are I think dependent on the rates, right? In the end of the day, so is it possible to play with these to test that further, or is this very complicated? I think I remember that bacteria sometimes can can change these rates by mutations, right? Yeah, yeah. Th uh, thank you for that question. Definitely, uh, we think the reason. So first, we think the reason uh, uh, applying this temporal gradual inputs helps us to uh, train this model better is because they are basically probing different rates that uh, that exist in this networks and probably the just one step rate is not able to probe those and we uh, we looked at that and we found that the parameters are better constrained when we are training with temporal inputs but to answer your question definitely if we generate let's say signaling activation under different mutation conditions that let's say we are able to change those rates or we are able to remove some part of uh, pathway or we, we, we express a protein at different levels and that is resulting in differential signaling activation similar to the phosphatase case we did and that would be also reached to better constrain these models but as you pointed out doing mutations and doing these studies is much harder than doing all these experiments on a wild type strain but rather setting these profiles in the extracellular. Thank you. Other questions? I think we have time for one more question. I, I'm happy to ask maybe a silly question. Um, so now that you've opened this kind of this ability to look at inputs that vary in time, that you've like this, there's this huge phase space that could be explored. Um, but then, of course, you don't want to explore everything. So does, do you think there's any value to testing, for instance, non-monotonic inputs? Would you learn anything? Uh, do you think you would learn anything if you use non-monotonic inputs? Yes, definitely. So so by by non, uh, yeah, by, 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 by that you mean if it's not just increasing, maybe we create pulses or, or let's say a sign input. So a few things. With uh, we so we are able to switch back between different media, so we can definitely use series of uh, we can combine this temporal inputs, then we can wash, we can switch back to media and apply another different type, and that also has challenges. But for sure, if we do these experiments for longer, these experiments we are now doing with this yeast system runs for let's say uh, one hour duration. But uh, that's something we can do. But a continuous profile to go up and down, we have a challenge now. Adding a stimuli with the current system we have is straightforward. But dilution, bringing down the concentration in a gradual way, there is a little bit of challenge because we, we need to add a lot of media to this mixing flask to dilute it to a given final concentration. But on the other hand, there are other ways we are thinking of being able to implement that we can uh, reduce the we can reduce the concentration gradually but at this moment in our setup we are able to wash it completely to media and apply a different temporal change okay great thank you very much um we're coming up on the end of the hour here so we should close out our formal session and switch over to our informal question session so i'll stop the recording